it's, as soon as I, I laid eyes on this family, the Holy Spirit said, you need to help them. You need to support them. And, and I, I sat back throughout that Friday and in the morning Saturday, and I just sat back and I was praying. I'm like, Lord, if this is you and not Casey, I, 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 will you please make it clear to me to make sure I'm not stepping outside your will? Lord, I, I just need you to, to let me know for sure because I want to do what you want. And uh, he made it clear throughout the day, and we, we had a little bit of interaction, not as much as I'd like to, but uh, it, was a, it was a lot packed in two days, in my opinion. Not a bad thing. It was great, but there was just a lot going on. Well, our final dinner um, Saturday, uh, I look over, and Justin and Allison and Christian were sitting at their table. And they were just surrounding them and soaking in everything that God had to share with us through them. And so I looked over and I said, all right, Lord, thank you. And then we get back and Allie, uh, she's like, we, we need to have them. We need to talk to them. We need to support them. And she, it was her idea to do the dinner last night. And um, God through you, of course. And, um, <clears throat> and so that's what we set out to do. We said, all right, we, we just want to have them come in. We heard their story, a few of us, but we want everybody to hear their story. And we want everybody to hear what God's doing and what they've done for God's kingdom and what they're about to do for God's kingdom. And not only that, but it, it I don't want to tell your story, so I'll stop there. You know how preachers are. We just talk. So. That was my daughter. What did she say? <laughs> and I'm sure it was Olivia, which is a direct replica of me. <laughs> so, without further ado, I want to invite the Reese's. Um, we got chairs. Justin brought up for you. You don't have to use them, but if you'd like, they are there. Microphone for each of you. It is not. It's there, just barely. <laughs> uh, thank you. Where? Usually, is it on the bottom? Yeah, just yeah, there it is, the bush. There, there we go. go. All right. Sorry, we are so not used to having two microphones. <laughs> we usually, like, stand and just this, this the whole time. This could be dangerous. This could be real dangerous. So, um, oh, my goodness. Thank you so much for welcoming us into your church, into your family here. Um, <laughs> It has been amazing to worship with you today. Um, I can't speak for her, but I've needed this kind of worship for a while, and I just wasn't finding it. Coming back, and we'll share some more. I'm, I'm totally, this is nowhere near what we normally talk about. So, But uh, we spent a year in Mexico in language school for the last year, and we've been back in the U.S. for the summer. And uh, we learned to worship in a new language in a church that had familiar melodies. But we, we learned so much about who we are in our faith and who God is as God. And I haven't had worship like that since we left Mexico. All the churches we visited, all the things, you know, God's allowed us to do this summer, and yet this is the first morning in like three months that I really feel like I was worshiping. So thank you, church. Thank you, and mostly to God, you know, you know but... You have welcomed the Spirit of the Lord in here. And we know he's, he's everywhere anyway, right? But when we open ourselves to him, to the Spirit, it's so, so different. And so I just want you all to know that I can affirm that you are doing the right thing. Okay? So uh, now that I've said that, <laughs> um, we are Tim and Stacy Reese. Uh, let's see, we've got our three kids. Um, Liam is there. Garrett is in the middle doing something, I don't know.
here. It's good. We are so used to passing a mic. See, this is just, this is it. It's organic. It's the way it's supposed to be. <laughs> so, but no, we are, we are the Reese family and there's Samantha. I didn't get to introduce her. It's okay. It just says low battery. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, we are going to share a little bit this morning about our call, um, but it's not just about us. What we really want you to hear in this is how God might be calling you. Uh, there's a lot of young people here today, and that is awesome. We don't get that opportunity. Uh, I don't want to steal her thunder either, but that's part of her story was being young and hearing about what God was doing and how that inspired her to sense the Spirit's calling in her life. So as we share, think about that calling part, because all we do is bear witness to what God has done and what he's doing and what he's already uh, uh, doing in the Dominican Republic because he doesn't need us there. He's the God who does it all. He owns it all. And yet he allows us to participate in his ministry uh, to his glory. So that's what we want to share today, um, our calling and where we'll be and how you guys can actually be involved in that as well. So um, quick wrap up. Uh, we've been married for 21 years. We have three kids. We're high school sweethearts. We started dating when we were 15. Went to college together, not because I cared about college, because I was chasing her. Um, <laughs> and uh, that's all I'm going to share because I'm taking away from your part now. So your turn. Okay, so we're going to share a little bit about our journey and how we got to the place where we are today. Um, but before I do that, I know you already kind of alluded to this, but as we were coming to the church yesterday, I felt the spirit moving in me um, to share with you all that, yes, we are called to go and serve in this way, but we're just ordinary people, right? God is the one that is equipping us. And I believe that everyone here also shares in that calling. Everyone here has the power and the authority given to them by the Holy Spirit, as it says in Acts 1.8. And so, God is calling us more than just to do something for his kingdom, right? He's calling us to himself, to hear his voice. And so as we share our call story, it's more than just God calling us to serve, you know, cross-culturally. That's, that's important, and we're excited to do that. But that calling can change. The only thing that doesn't change is God himself. And so our calling is to him and him alone. And we just have to get out of the way, right? And be his conduit. Let the spirit th flow through us without us getting in the way. And so listen for that in our story about us getting out of the way and letting God be God. And however long that takes. And for me, I'm celebrating my 42nd birthday. Yes, today. Yes. And as you'll see as I share my story, you know, it began early on in life and it's taken this long for me to get out of God's way, right? And learn what I needed to learn to be prepared to serve in the way that I'm going to serve. Um, so I just wanted to share that. Um, but I'll start. Um, so I was raised in a Christian home, grew up in church my whole life. My parents were active in the church, and I was always there for, you know, Sunday school, um, VBS, whatever, um, whenever the doors were open. Um, and so I remember our church just being very missional. Um, we would host mission uh, missionaries from all over the world and send them out, and even my aunt and uncle were missionaries. So everywhere I looked, missionaries were there. And they were kind of put up on this pedestal, you know, like, oh, wow, you know, they're, they're great. And they are. They're great. But I kind of missed the point a little bit um, and kind of elevated them. And I don't know where I'm going with this, but <laughs> it's just part of the journey that, that God had to change my mindset a little bit. Um, so I was sitting just on a Sunday morning, just like this one, and I was listening to the sermon. I don't even remember exactly what it was about, but I remember the Spirit moving in my heart, and he was calling me to be a missionary, and I felt it so intensely that I couldn't stay in my seat. 
at the end of the service. They would always welcome people forward for prayer or whatever. And I was just sitting in there just wrestling in my seat. No one, my family was sitting with me. They had no idea that I was wrestling with this. And I was terrified. I was, did I mention I was 11? Um, and I'm sitting there and I'm just, God, please don't ask me to get up in front of this big church of like 3,000 people. It was a big church. And I just remember having to set myself aside and take that stand for Christ. And that's been the ongoing theme that he's called me to, is to set more and more of myself aside to let him and his spirit flow through me. And so, um, long story short, about a 20-year period of me, you know, on fire to serve Christ in this way, but having no idea what that looks like. And so I began making plans of my own and expecting God to bless them. Looking at, you know, my aunt and uncle who were missionaries, looking at my uncle who was going into the ministry and serving and, and trying to kind of follow their path because I really didn't know where God was leading me. And so you can expect that it didn't work out the way that I expected. I didn't get into the college, you know, the Bible school that I applied in. Even though I had good grades, God just kept closing the door in my face and saying, no, this isn't it. And that was really hard for me. I doubted God in, those, in that 20-year period. I didn't know what he was doing and where he was taking me. And so I'll let you kind of take over from there and begin your, your yeah. story. So <clears throat> she had this 20-year, like she said, 20-year from 11 years old to 31 years old when God started to allow her to see the vision more. And I know she questioned a lot, did I even hear, <laughs> did I even hear you right, God? Did you really want me to get up that Sunday morning? Um, so, yeah, I mean, my, my story is very similar. Grew up in a, in a Christian home, an American Baptist church up in Canton, Ohio. Uh, my dad was the worship leader, my mom was the Sunday school superintendent and the leader of all the women's groups, and we were the first family at church every Sunday morning to turn the lights on, and the last family to leave to turn the lights off, and that's how I grew up. And it was a small church, it was, it was like 100 people. Um, and uh, we never hosted missionaries, and occasionally when we had one, I thought they were weird. <laughs> like, I'd talk to the kids about like comic books, I'd be like, do you guys like Batman? And they're like... I mean, this is, you know, we're going back to the 80s here, you know, but it was just, you know, I could not understand why anyone would be like, you know, I wanted video games and comic books and, and Star Wars, and these, these missionary kids knew nothing about that, so I thought they were weird. So I never, ever, ever in my life would have thought I'd be a missionary. I'll just say that right there. Not that I never told God I wouldn't do it. I just never thought I would. And so growing up in that, I, I always figured I'd be involved in church somehow. Um, when I was in Ending high school and starting college, again, college wasn't as important to me as where she was going and being where she was. So I applied to the same Bible school, and I didn't get in either. So then we scrambled and, uh, what's the right word? Enrolled, registered, applied, I don't even know. It was Too very last-minute right application. So, so we were able to get into Malone University, local to us up in, in the Canton area, um, and so we, we, you know, did our studies and all that. But during that time period, I actually had a falling out. It was a different pastor in our church at this point, in my home church where I grew up. It wasn't the same, and I was feeling God calling me. I didn't know what, and this pastor was really discouraging. And I won't get into it now. If you want to know more about the story, I'm happy to share it. But it actually pushed me away from the community. I didn't stop believing in God. I didn't doubt him for one minute, but I doubted the body. And so in college, again, studying for business because I started out in youth ministry and then when I found out with a youth ministry degree and when I found out that just this, what I felt the church was doing, I decided I don't need a piece of paper to talk about Jesus. So I switched to business because that made sense because then I could, you know, make money and all that good stuff. And, and uh, you know, so, um, but I was extremely bullied as a kid, suffered a lot from that and, uh, I, because I had seen this broken relationship with someone like me that had tattoos and earrings and listened to, you know, really, really uh, loud rock music and things like that. I was like, you know what, there's a whole bunch of kids that I know my home church won't accept. How do I get the gospel to those kids? And so me and two friends in college started a, a Christian rock band. 
And we did that all through college, and then we graduated and all got jobs and should have been focusing on those jobs, right, making that money and having careers and getting to that point where we could have a family and all that. But while working 40, 50, 60 hours a week, I was still the singer and guitar player in this Christian rock band that was uh, practicing two nights a week and then Friday, Saturday, and Sunday playing everywhere from youth groups to bars to skate parks to universities to summer festivals to, I mean, we'd have one weekend 10 people at a concert and the next weekend 1,000. It was just, we never knew. And so we were taking the gospel through music, unlikely music, to kids that we saw, you know, young adults, college age, high school, that, that weren't getting churched. And, and honestly, a lot of churches probably would have been scared of them, you know? And so this is both, a, a, this is like one of those double-edged sword type things. And I didn't know until later, it wasn't that I wasn't doing a good thing in the name of Christ. But like she said, getting out of our own way, I never actually submitted to God and said, do you want me to do this for you? Is this what I can do for your kingdom? And so where it started out, where the glory was to go to God, for many years, that's where it was. But then at the end, after a decade, we were offered a record deal. And we'd been getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And it was amazing. We were playing shows with, with bands that were professional, well-known, you know. And I stared at that record deal, and I'm like, this isn't it. I felt like God was saying, you need to get out of this and go get back in church. So uh, I walked away from the music and told God, if I never play my guitar again, I'm totally cool with that. God let me play my guitar again, <laughs> leading worship with the youth group at our church when we got involved after that. And, uh, but I'll, now I'm actually jumping ahead. So let me, let me go backwards one second. Anyway, I'll wrap all that up by saying God allowed that to actually happen again. And we did ministry with youth through our church. I was able to be our youth pastor there for six years. But it, wasn't, it, wasn't, it didn't happen other than God restoring that relationship with the, with the church, with the community, with the body. Because I, that was broken for me. And so um, I think that happened because we submitted to God's will. So jump back a few years before that happened. Sorry, my, you know, my brain. Um, we were doing really good in our careers. We were 31. We had lots of money, more money than we knew what to do with. We had a nice house. We had a new car every couple years. We had big TVs and Xboxes and anything we could have wanted. Liam was about 18 months old. But we were working so much, we weren't in church on a regular basis. Even though, you know, we wanted to, we felt like that's what God wanted. But we were also feeling like God wanted us to build something for our family, right? To be able to provide for them. Um, and we only had one at the time. Uh, so all these things seemed like they were going really well for us. But we were fighting a lot. Our marriage was not going well. Um, on the surface, it seemed like we had everything together. But we were so unsatisfied. Life, you know, everything we had, it just didn't satisfy. And so in the middle of a fight that I can't remember what it was about, it was that important of a fight. This voice says in my head, quit your job and become a missionary. So I looked at her <laughs> and I said, let's quit our jobs and become missionaries. So this, this would have been basically 20 years for her, just about 20 years from when she said yes. And I spent all that time telling God how I'd serve instead of letting him show me how I could serve. And, and in that moment, we got something right, but then we had absolutely no idea what to do next. Yeah. And he's not lying. We had no idea. Um, but I feel at that moment, we were right where God wanted us to be. We were out of the way, finally, and saying, here we are. Whatever you want to do, we'll do it, and doing it together now. Um, I can't even explain to you the joy that I felt in that moment after all of that waiting, um, but it was finally happening. Um, and so from that point on, the only thing that we could think to do was to connect with uh, my aunt and uncle who were missionaries and just share our heart and where God was moving us. And they are the ones that really pointed us back to getting connected 
with a home church where we could serve and where that calling would be confirmed to just really get in with a community of believers because they knew we couldn't do it alone. And so that is so important, community. And, and we've learned so much more about community being in Mexico for that 10 month period and the importance of community, it's just grown. Um, and I just love being a part of your community and realizing that our community as we go and share is growing too. You are a part of the community as we are sent out. Um, and so I don't know where I'm going with that. <laughs> um, but so we got connected with First Baptist in Maslin and um, shared our hearts with the pastor there, uh, Roger Alber. And he just really spoke wisdom into our, our lives and connected us with International Ministries, our sending organization. And um, without that connecting piece, we wouldn't be here today. Um, International Ministries really unlocked something that was missing for me. Um, you know, growing up in a church, a big Baptist church that was all about missions, but it, it wasn't the same way that International Ministries thought of missions work as being um, vocational missions. Um, that was a piece that I had never heard about. Um, and I love to share the story of when um, Tim was able to go to the 2014 um, the Green Lake Mission Conference where they welcomed back all the global servants from around the world. And he was able to get a free ticket to sit in all the meetings behind the scenes and listen to the missionaries share their joys and their sorrows and things like that and ask questions. Um, I was not there with him, but I remember one message that he sent me um, in particular that I will always remember. He said, Stacy, they need people with business degrees. And I don't know if we mentioned that we majored in business, which in my mind never really made sense in how God would use a business degree for missions. And then it was connected in that moment through international ministries. And I realized that it doesn't really matter what your vocation is. God can still use it for his glory. And so let that be an encouragement to you wherever you are and whatever you're doing, you are a missionary in your communities where you're serving here locally too, and that's so important. Um, and so uh, with International Ministries, they encouraged us to take some trips to discover where God you know, wanted us to, to serve. And so um, we went to, the first trip was, you went to Nicaragua um, with our home church and did a medical missions team with Amos. Um, and they're focused in health and wellness and um, clean water. And so he was able to do that. Um, and then we went together to Liberia, West Africa. And so that I consider my first missions trip. And I know you guys are all headed to Africa um, in March, which is exciting. Um, and so we were open to all of these places that God might potentially send us. But we just didn't really feel the spirit moving on those trips. And so there was one final trip that we took with our home church. And this was more of a construction trip. Um, to the Dominican Republic. And we were doing hard labor out in the sun, shoveling rock, and I don't even know, um, making a... We were laying the foundation <laughs> of a community building for a church. So we had to put out the grid of rebar and put in all yeah. the gravel, and then they brought in the big trucks that poured the concrete. And yeah, the it was it was a lot, a lot of work. Um, we got sunburns big time. Um, <laughs> but I just found myself not even caring about that and just wanting to be with the people more than anything, just engage with them and work alongside them. I, I've never felt myself want to work that hard in my entire life. Um, and there was one time when we got to get away and go out with Ketley and Vital Pierre, who are global servants in La Romana in the Dominican Republic, and they um, took us to a bate, which we're going to show you in our video here in a little bit, um, which is where the sugarcane plantations are, and they have villages that are kind of all around where the sugarcane bate uh, communities are, and that is where the Haitian workers live with their families, and we'll show you what their housing looks like and, and some of the needs there, but just in our, our brief moments um, in those communities with Ketley, I cannot even convey to you in words the way that the spirit was moving in my heart when we were there. I could not take pictures, even though they said, you'll want to take some pictures so that you can create a slideshow to show churches. I could not do any of that. I was just so 
in the moment and felt the presence of the Holy Spirit over me. Um, and I just cried, just cried. And I, uh, Ketley turned around in the car while we were driving and she said, are you okay, honey? And I said, these are my people. That was my words, these are my people. And I just knew. Um, but again, uh, there were moments, even with that certainty of knowing that this is where we were called, where the plan changed and we were moved to Haiti and then back to the Dominican Republic again. And there's a crazy story that we could share about that. Um, and like I said, callings change. The places that God sends us, what he wants us to do changes, but he himself does not change. His power and his authority that he has given to every believer here in this room that does not change. Everybody is valuable in the kingdom of God. Everybody has a purpose, and there is no one higher than another. Um, I don't know. I'm going to give it over to you. Yeah, so even in, this, even in this calling, after going through this whole process and everything, like she mentioned, I'll just say it real quick, because you, you pointed out our business card that I am made for says Haiti. Uh, we went back to international ministries after this trip to the Dominican Republic, after we met the Haitians in the sugarcane plantations, and we said, this, this, this is great. This is where we feel God's calling us. And they go, hmm, that's really neat. We don't have any partners for you to work with there. The way international ministries does their missions work is we don't just go into a country and start doing things. We work through a national partner that knows the people there, that knows the country, that knows the culture, that knows the history. And through those partnerships, like our partnership was with eight churches. And so as we work with these churches that are mostly Haitian or Dominican, we, we de and now I'm getting ahead of myself again. We see ourselves as being the, this bridge between the churches and the communities where the gospel and the work we'll be doing there will actually take place. Um, because we wanted to be the churches. We wanted to be Haitian pastors going in and preaching in Creole to the Haitians. We find that to be so much more valuable than if I just went in and started preaching, you know. I, I'm the white guy from out of town. These are people that, that the lasting, the, the, the community that can be built when it's centered around their language, their culture, and then the gospel infused in that by Haitian pastors, that is how you have sustainability. That is how you have churches that last long after the missionaries move into another community. So we had to say, well, God, all right, uh, there's no partner here, but we feel, we feel connected here. So international ministry said, how about Haiti? And we said, you know what, we'll pray about it. It didn't take much prayer. We were like, we wanna work with Haitians. Let's go to Haiti. Uh, and so we began fundraising to go to Haiti. And we, we were fundraising for about four months and then COVID happened. And it completely shut down our entire calendar year, every conference, every church visit, everything was canceled. And in that time, Everything got worse in Haiti. The protests, the riots, the violence. Ultimately, the president of the country was assassinated. It became so dangerous to be a foreigner there, not just a missionary, but just a foreigner in Haiti, that most mission organizations pulled, as well as aid groups. Everyone started pulling their workers out. And so international ministries, we got a call, and they said, you want to go to, uh, can you meet us in the Dominican Republic? And we're like, okay, we can, I mean, we're in Ohio, you're in Philadelphia, it's just like a seven-hour drive, but they wanted to meet in the Dominican Republic. And the reason was, was they wanted to introduce us to some possible partners and then tell us that because of the situation in Haiti, they wanted to move our family to the Dominican Republic to work with Haitian migrants. The exact same thing we told them we wanted to do and yet we were asked to sort of, you know, give that back to God as an offering too. So that's why our business cards say Haiti, because we just never had new ones printed up. <laughs> yeah, they gave us um, a lot. <laughs> but uh, so we do have a video, and we're going to go ahead and have you cue that up. This video we made uh, because it does illustrate um, a little bit of the history of the Bates, um, these plantations that they are. Uh, it shows you how Haitians live, and it does show you some of the opportunities we'll have in ministry, and then we can... Uh, in closing, share how you guys can be involved in those ministries as well um, and uh, be able to come do good things to work with the Haitians there. So, and it's got. In the 1930s, the Dominican government began bringing. in Haitian migrants to do the seasonal work needed in the sugarcane fields. 
these Haitians were willing to leave their families under the promise that they could provide a better life for them. These rural slum communities became known as Batays. The Batays were comprised of one-room houses with no electricity, no running water, no cooking facilities, and no bathrooms. Despite the living conditions, many Haitians chose to stay in these communities year-round and even sent for their family members to come and live there while others started families of their own. Over time, the need for better housing, education for their children, and access to health care only increased. Little has changed in the last 100 years. Today, Haitian children face struggles of their own. Of the Batays that have schools, many don't offer beyond an elementary education. While many of these government-led schools do provide students one meal a day, in some cases, this could be the only food they receive. Boys and girls as young as 10 and 11 are then expected to choose between helping to support their families or walking to a secondary school that may be located outside of their community. With such few options, many children are left marginalized and at risk of abuse. They become trapped in a cycle of extreme generational poverty with seemingly no end in sight. Many of the Batays rely on the aid work of NGOs and the goodwill of many serving on mission trips each year, as well as the humanitarian efforts of the Good Samaritan Hospital located in La Romana. Many of the churches in the DR have responded to the growing needs of the more than 200 Batays spread throughout the country by providing food, basic hygiene, medical services, and clean drinking water. Another reality is that many lack the proper documentation needed to provide them with legal rights or even seek other forms of employment outside of the Batays. Despite all the faithful work of so many, there are still many Batays that remain unreached. There are many opportunities for economic and community development within the Batays, but also with Haitians who have made a way outside of the sugarcane industry. Tourism is one of the largest sources of income for Haitians. Through Baptist Church Alliance ministries like the Oasis of Peace, Haitians young and old are offered continued education and mentorship. Existing programs promote literacy, English and Spanish language classes, personal hygiene, and discipleship through the gospel. A playground, community garden, and a gathering place for the elderly are also part of the future vision for the community center in La Romana. This is where our ministry opportunity lies. As International Ministries Global Servants, we can help facilitate ongoing programs in partnership with the Good Samaritan Hospital, community outreach programs, short-term volunteer groups, and other IM missionaries in answer to God's call. We look forward to joining in the good work that God is already doing in the Dominican Republic. Even since making this video, some things have changed for us. We were in Mexico for about six weeks when we got a call from our area director, and we were anticipating being in the south, working out of Santo Domingo, living in Santo Domingo, the capital, and working in La Romana, which is pictured in, in uh, some of the videos there. And they asked us if we would go and live in Santiago in the north. So a complete change. And yet, you know, like we said, the calling, what God asked us to do, it's fluid, you know, and, and so we said, sure, we'll go live in the city we've never seen and, and have our kids go to a school that uh, we've never met the teachers and things. So, but um, most of what that video says about the vocational training and all that will continue. We're, we're going to implement a lot of that in the north with the partnership of the eight churches there. We'll be working with the Haitian Baptist Convention and Dominican churches there in the north. Um, a big, big opportunity there is not just for vocational job skill training and language acquisition training for Haitians so that they can get jobs away from the Batays. And, and I do wanna make sure I say this, working in the Batays is extremely hard work 
cutting that cane by hand for 14 hours a day with a machete is extremely hard work. It is a very honorable job, but it only pays about a dollar a day. And while we think it's good work, we believe they deserve more, or at least the opportunity to do more if they so choose. And so by offering vocational training, it, it opens the door for Haitians to be connected with business owners who are involved in the, in the tourist uh, locations that have you know, the shopping malls, the pizza huts, all those things. They, if they can speak Spanish and English, they can get jobs there and make a lot more than a dollar a day to support their families. So that's one of the big opportunities there is in the vocational training. The other side is Haitian pastors, their churches, they can't afford to pay a full-time pastor. And so oftentimes the pastors, the Haitian pastors in these communities, if the community is fortunate enough to have a church, the pastors are just as poor as the community themselves. And they're struggling to care for their family and their church community. So the door is opened uh, to offer vocational training to pastors as well. So they can become bivocational pastors and have an income that is, is better to support their family, allowing them then at least to maybe remove some of that stress so that they can be hopefully more successful in, in discipling and growing churches in their communities. Um, those communities with the, with the green wooden houses, you could fit, if I'm, if I'm not including the piano and the drum set, you could fit three of those houses on this, this, this area here. And typically, it's, it's not just a single person. It's a whole family. And oftentimes, multiple generations living in that one little house. And so, and those are actually, by the way, those are the nice batets. These are the ones that get mission teams on a regular basis. Um, most of the, the houses in these communities, they're, they're built uh, so that when a hurricane knocks them down, they just stand them back up. Um, that's the idea here. So, uh, Right now, the estimates, I've, I've spoken with missionaries, I've spoken with the director of the Good Samaritan Hospital, uh, Moise is his name, and there's no accurate number because the Dominican government has not done a census, has not gone in to find out how many Haitians are there. It's estimated there are between 250,000 and a million Haitians working and living, and, and that's the ones that are fortunate enough to have a job because if you get injured cutting cane and can't work any longer, you're evicted, your whole family's kicked out, and you end up going to what are called barrios, which are the poorest, uh, poorest communities typically surrounding the cities. And that's where a lot of the crime and gangs and things like that, you know, that type of stuff takes place in those barrios because they're almost, you know, less, less hopeful than even in the batets because at least they're getting paid a little bit to work in the batet. And so it's, it's, it's mind-blowing to me that there's, there's anywhere on a given day three quarters of a million people that are just in flux. They don't know where they are. They don't know who they are. They don't know, it, you know, and it, that's, wow. You know, so there are more than 250 of those communities. And in the center part of the island, most of those remain unreached. There, you know, we talk about unreached people groups in, in, you know, that still exist in, in South America, in, in, you know, the Amazon and things like that. And yet there, there are people that don't have churches that didn't even know that COVID was happening. They were so remote. They didn't even know COVID was happening, you know? Uh, and so those are the communities that we would like to long-term eventually get into and bring mission teams into, uh, help uh, plant pastors there that can establish churches in those communities. Um, so while we're doing a lot of business and vocational training, there's still the opportunity for discipleship, church planting, uh, ministry work like that, VBS, all kinds of things. Um, and so we will be at some point in the, in the relatively near future uh, hosting mission teams. And, you know, we're, we're very excited. You know, you guys are going to Kenya. That's awesome. Um, and we wanted to ask you a little bit more about the, the missionary that you guys are working with there. It just didn't come up last night. We talked about it afterwards. We should have asked. Um, but uh, one thing we, we mentioned last night is, is because of the, the African roots of the Haitians, much of the ministry there is actually very similar to doing ministry work in Africa. And so it's kind of like the Africa that's not 18 hours away is <laughs> kind of the way we, we look at it. So um, it does offer a really neat opportunity to experience God uh, 
in multiple cultures at once because you have the Dominican culture and the Haitian culture blending. And it's a very unique island, a very, very unique experience. But um, as, we, as we look to host mission teams, we'll be staying in touch and letting you guys know how you can come along um, and partner there. Uh, I'm saying a lot. Would you like to say anything now? Um, <laughs> maybe we could just uh, share a little bit about um, what's next for us. Um, so right now we are staying um, in Ohio. We have been blessed with a lady that um, just lost her husband maybe a year and a half ago, and she has this great big house, and she's allowed us to stay in her upstairs with three bedrooms, two bathrooms. It's, it's been amazing. Um, we did not anticipate to have um, a place to stay like this um, during our time uh, back here. So um, that's been great to, you know, basically rest while we're not visiting churches on the weekends. Um, and we've been preparing our visa paperwork, which has been quite a challenge to gather up all the paperwork. It's a, an extensive list of documents that they require. Um, we're going to be making a trip to Columbus to get um, our birth certificates apostilled and, and all of these things. Um, if these words don't make sense, they didn't make sense to us either until we had to actually do some of these things. Um, and it's an expensive, time-consuming process, and so that's what we're in the midst of, is getting all of that turned in and submitted, and we're just praying for a timely return of our visa so that we can get to the Dominican Republic and so that the kids can get enrolled um, in Oasis Christian School. Um, we're excited uh, to just begin this journey, um, but we appreciate your prayers as we prepare. Um, we're expecting maybe late September, early October. Um, but we don't actually have our tickets yet, so we're waiting um, to do that. Once we have the visas in hand, we're going to be going on the website and booking those tickets. Um, but, yes, we just appreciate your prayers as we continue through those steps um, that God's laid before us. Um, anything to add? No, you wrapped that up very nicely. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we just, again, we, we're so grateful to have this opportunity to be with you today to share um, to give testimony, you know, to what God's already doing, because those eight churches we'll be partnered with in the north, they're having church today too. You know what I mean? It's not like the gospel's coming because we're coming. Um, and, and that's sort of, like I said, we, we, you know, really pray that we can be a bridge. It's something we say quite often, uh, you know, in scripture we read, blessed are the feet that carry the gospel, right? Um, we want to be that bridge that the feet carrying the gospel cross Amen. between the churches and these communities that, that need Christ. So, um, as you continue to pray, uh, just for, for people all around the world, please don't forget the Haitians. Um, they are the poorest people in the Western Hemisphere uh, and the most overlooked people. Uh, other, than, other than, I believe, historically Israel, Haiti is considered the most uh, uh, diverse um, diaspora, they call it. So they have, they have more people, more Haitians living all around the globe than actually in Haiti. Um, and other than Israel, they're the most displaced people. It's a very interesting history for them. So, but uh, again, thank you so much for, for having us in to worship with you today, allowing us this time to share. Um, and we, we look forward to, you know, getting to see what else God has in store for you guys, for us, and how it all comes together. So thank you so much. So here's what I want to do. Um, I want to just take like five minutes if anybody has questions. Um, and, and I do want to point out just to make sure there's no confusion because there was one picture that showed, you know, a beach resort. They're not going to be living on the beach. Uh, you know, they're, they're going to be in the, the migrant facilities and housings and uh, they're going to be doing work in the slum. So I, I just want to make sure nobody took away from that, that that's what these guys are going to be doing because it's not going to be like that. And the other thing was when, when it was showing the, the guys on the bikes and the sand and the houses and the, the plastic chairs, that's exactly like I, I flashed back to the villages in, in Africa. That's exactly what it was like. Uh, but let's just take like a, no more than five minutes um, to see if anybody has questions for these guys. Now just go for it. Oh, oh, okay, okay. We might not have anybody. You guys did a phenomenal job. You covered it all. You don't want to ask a question in front of everyone. Happy to answer. Okay. All right. 
Well, very good. Um, if, if I can have uh, you come up real quick. Come up. Come up. I was told Rachel and Larry are coming up too. Rachel's coming up and Larry's coming up, I was told. Both of them are like, no. There you go. We want to take this moment. I know that last night with the meet and greet, I was just... God just laid some, um, the energy and the uh, lit the fire that I had inside already, um, just fanned that flame, and we are so proud to join you two, your family. Uh, we are going to partner with you on a monthly basis. This is a love offering to cover for the rest of the year, and... Um, So we, last night, I'm um, talking about this, and God laid 200 on my, in my head and in my heart, and I've been praying about it, and so we are giving 200 a month, so we have a check in here for $800 to cover for the rest of this year, and we will continue in the new year, and then there was a donation as well, cash offering, that is also in the envelope. We want to thank you for listening to God on how he asks you to give as well. Um, our missions, we have no budget. I don't know in advance when the money's there. So when I come forward and I op open up and offer new things, this is God laying on you what you want to be. This is our, the missions is not just me. It's not just Christian and Ali. This is the church. The church is the mission team. We're just leaders. We can't do this without you. God, can't, God can do this without us, yes. But listen to God on how you, he wants you to give. Each individual family is different. So with that, we are thankful that God laid you guys in our path and that we get to help support you and you and those three wonderful children. And um, we're going to be doing ministry together. And um, so we're, we're going to do communion, and then we're going to pray over you if that's okay. And if not, we're going to do it anyways. <laughs> that's the way I do things. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, and what we're going to do is we're going to move that table. And we're just going to put your family in the middle, and we're just going to pray over you guys. I know you've already been commissioned, so we're not commissioning you. We're just we're just playing, praying God's protection and blessings over you, okay? All right, so um, we'll forego a, our weekly altar call this week, um, and we'll, we'll do communion, and then we're going to pray over these folks. So, um, and you all know what we do when we pray over people. We all get together, and you can feel the Holy Spirit just moving. Um, so with that, if you guys want to, everybody go, go down. We'll, we'll do communion, and then we'll, we'll pray over you guys. All right, deacons and deaconesses, if you'd like to come up.
in 1 Corinthians chapter 11.